Cycling is a very interesting thing. In Bangladesh, Ganeshastha Kendra, where I worked for so many years, in 1973, we introduced cycle for the health workers to improve the effectiveness, to improve the work, to, to ease the workload and to have the more aid. We had a fantastic result. So I think, the, as Susan B. Anthony is definitely right, the bicycle has done more for the women emancipation than anything else. One interesting thing I want to tell, when our uh, health worker of Ganeshastha Kandra started riding a bicycle, opposition came from two quarters. One from a one nearby cantonment, army object to that, why if women ride a bicycle through the cantonment, it disturbed the discipline of the cantonment. Secondly, in an one municipal area of Jamalpur, the very highly educated chairperson of the municipality, he objected to that. He said, it doesn't look nice, girls riding a bicycle through the city, or through the local town. Of course, the girls, they said, well, we don't enjoy it, but if you pay for our rickshaw fare, we are happy to use the rickshaw, but the organization is not going to pay. But remember, we are 50 girls, so calculate the economics on that basis. Uh, he was a doctorate, the chairman was a doctorate. So sometimes very highly educated people are very, uh, 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 <laughs> very opposed to the, any changes. We have tried to bring a change from a different way in emergency patients. In 1980, I was a member of a women's commission in Bangladesh. We have introduced that every school should have 100 percent, primary school should have, a, uh, should have a female teachers. Objection came from the female member. He said, it doesn't look good. If all female teachers, I said, look, madam, even if the 100 percent women are recruited, it will take 50 years in Bangladesh to become 50 percent of the total teacher, total teachers. But however, now it is 60 percent. One female teacher attracted 10 more girls. When she walks through the village, itself is a revolution. I think the recruitment of women as a, as a school teacher and in this field is also very effective. Of course, cycling, I'm all for the cycling. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. Let me now, uh, Dr. Chaudhary. Let me now invite Dr. Surjit Bhala, he's chairman of Onyx Investments and Research India. Dr. Th Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, look, it's uh, an absolute uh, pleasure to comment on uh, three extremely uh, excellent papers. I, I, you know, it is, I don't have a, a single comment other than praise for all three of them. And I think what they illustrate, uh, and in juxtaposition to what we've been discussing yesterday uh, and perhaps the night before, um, this is economics the old fashioned way. Uh, this is uh, where, and I'm very pleased that Murli Dhawan hasn't has left uh, the RCT at least for a while to do economics the old-fashioned way and and derive results uh, which are just as convincing, if not more convincing, uh, than um, if you will uh, the new-fashioned way uh, in, in India. And and you know my comments will be um, if you will both the papers are on India, but I think they have. Uh, if you will, reflection as well as impact on uh, on uh, other societies as well, including Pakistan. Um, but you know, in India, we 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 like to even debate the existence of gravity, uh, and it's very sad. And there's what these two papers illustrate as to how um, diabolical and how. Uh, uh, if you will, costly, uh, are debating with, uh, with gravi about gravity is. For example, cash transfers. Uh, you know, we are still debating the, uh, the worthwhile nature of cash transfers. Um, in 2006, um, the um, then finance minister, also the finance minister today, um, Mr. Chidambaram, 
proposed uh, that we replace the public distribution system uh, with a, a food stamp system on a pilot basis in two states in India, uh, West Bengal and Kerala. And so therefore this was announced in the budget speech that we will have uh, food stamps rather than the PDS system uh, to see if it worked. And uh, lo and behold, and not very surprisingly, uh, there were no takers in these two states which were, if you will, uh, well known for their concern for the poor. So um, that system went away and we c continued with that system and um, if you will, uh, we're debating and now that the cash transfers, you know, the real problem with cash transfers is that basically uh, you, you give the money and the husband takes it away and uh, consumes alcohol. Now, if you were to add up how much money we spend uh, in, in the name of the poor and how much of it, uh, if you will, if they were all to be consumed in terms of alcohol, they, I don't think there's enough alcohol in the world uh, to, if you will, take care of $4 billion uh, that we spend, uh, or 4% of GDP actually, which is more than uh, $4 billion, um, to, to spend on, uh, on, on uh, alcohol. So, you know, the, in, in terms of this bicycle program and, you know, Molidhan being who he is, Karthik being who he is, you know, went into great detail as to how, you know, he, he took care of every objection um, that could possibly be raised um, as to the worthwhile nature of this and why, if you will, the bicycles did get stolen or didn't get spent on alcohol. Um, you know, on a trip to uh, Bihar, sort of 2008, 2009, uh, when in a group of people I had the honor and privilege of meeting Nitish Kumar, so we asked him this direct question uh, as to, uh, you know, uh, didn't you think, first of all, it's very important to emphasize that the program was that the cash would be given, not the bicycle. Now, a traditional Indian way would be that the state would procure the bicycles, exactly as we procure the food. The state would then have a shop which would sell the bicycle exactly as we sell the food and then the person would go there and buy it uh, from a state manufactured bicycle. Okay? Um, and this is the traditional way we still do things and I want to come to the PDS in a minute. Um, this program, basically the cash was given uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the girl and uh, the question was why didn't the father take it away to consume alcohol or for other reasons, uh, whatever? And he had a very simple answer. He said, peer pressure. The girl knows that other girls in the school have got the money. They will be coming on a bicycle. And if she didn't come on the bicycle, then everybody would know what has happened. So it was simple, if you will, peer pressure according to him, and I think very plausible, that made this system succeed, that made this cash transfer succeed. So we, and it wasn't a control experiment, this was whatever was done, and we then come, economists then come uh, with all our tools to see if it worked. I, I, it, it, it has really worked. Now I want to come to uh, Jeff Hammer's paper, and uh, you know, it's, uh, I've, uh, if you will, uh, it's very important to um, emphasize the importance of this paper and, if you will, uh, the earlier and joint work that Jeff is doing with uh, Dean Spears on the, if you will, um, what explains um, and what policy measures might be needed about the whole problem of uh, malnutrition, undernutrition, and, if you will, um, the weight for height, which was an index of this. Now, you know, Nobel Prize winners uh, in the form of uh, certainly Amartya Sen, Jean Dres, um, and several other economists uh, have looked at the puzzle. And the puzzle is that here is India, which has had uh, liberalization, and in, in many quarters in India, liberalization is still a four-letter word, um, that you had this economic liberalization, and lo and behold, you had rapid growth. Uh, we didn't really have rapid growth in the 90s. We had it in the 2002, but never mind. We certainly had an acceleration of growth. And, you know, 
inequality massively increased in India. Uh, and uh, what happened was that the poor didn't benefit at all from this. And what's the evidence that the poor didn't benefit from this is that their living standards, malnutrition, etc., uh, did not improve. And what was the or nutrition did not improve? And what was the most telling uh, evidence for this was look at the poorest states in sub-Saharan Africa. You look at the poorest states in sub-Saharan Africa, which are you know five times poorer than India in terms of per capita income or four times poorer and they have much better weight for height for children. So the poorest states in sub-Saharan Africa have much better weight for height which is if you will a neutral index so you don't have to go into PPPs uh, and whatever and you have uh, that they were performing much better and this was if you will the policy conclusion from this and this gets serious is that we should expand the food security program in India. We should deliver more food to the poor uh, in order that our nutritional status improves. Along comes uh, Dean Spears and Jeff Hammer, etc., and they show that listen, uh, practically, and you know, then we had uh, a lot of research in India, and uh, uh, Arvind Panagriya, one of the uh, leaders in, in terms of looking at this, um, even came to, you know, looked at, dissected the data on Indian growth, and came up with a quasi genetic explanation as to why uh, it was a case that it wasn't that inequality had increased, it wasn't that the poor were getting worse off, but that genetically, etc., uh, we were at a disadvantage uh, in terms of this, and therefore we showed uh, what had happened. Now, very simple, non-randomized trial research, right, then went and showed that, listen, if you look at open defecation, one simple variable, and Jeff uh, knows these results much more than I do, but broadly, explains almost the entire difference in the Indian, um, uh, in the, in the Indian uh, weight for height of children as well as the sub-Saharan African poor states of whom we were much worse than. Just this one simple variable. So it really doesn't have uh, that much to do with uh, inequality rising or that much to do with food security. And I want to take, if you will, uh, two minutes, um, no more, um, about the, the nature of the food security system as to what goes on um, in the name of the poor. Uh, and this is obviously uh, how we, we have conducted policy. And the natural question which uh, Jeff was maybe uh, too polite to ask is, uh, you know, basically in Europe, in the US, in the late 19th century, they knew about the public good aspects about uh, nutrition, about uh, water, sanitation, and nutrition, and therefore there were massive public works programs in all of these countries. Uh, but in India, uh, we decided to build temples of learning and uh, a food distribution system in order to take care of the poor, rather than the most obvious uh, method. I have the following explanation as to why we went that way. Um, it is that, the, you know, the, the cost, I don't think, as, is as much, we are, we are spending in India uh, something like 3% uh, of GDP uh, each year on what uh, one calls doles, uh, you know, in the name of the poor programs to help the poor. Uh, if, this, if this money was spent on water and sanitation, and I don't think it will cost that much. Uh, this is per year, mind you, 3% of GDP per year. Um, if, the, if it was spent on uh, water and sanitation, it would be a lot better. Last two sentences. Um, just for your information, we, um, that the, there are 50 million metric tons of food grains, at least 50 million metric tons of food grains procured per year in India in order to distribute to the poor. Out of this, Half of it is lost in translation, in transition, etc. Doesn't even get to the ration shops. Uh, about uh, uh, a fifth of this, according to official government of India permissions uh, admission, is rotting 
because in India we, we are really very backward, we have no idea how to store food and all the emphasis they are just exporting to the US, we don't have any accounting systems by which we can find out how much food. I have one very simple explanation for why food rots in India, it obviously doesn't but it goes into the liquor trade uh, and therefore everybody is better off other than the poor. Bottom line, about 10% of the food procured for the poor actually reaches the poor. That is economics, the old-fashioned way, that's when seeking the old-fashioned way, and that's political economy, the old-fashioned and the present-fashioned way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhala. Let's now open the floor. We've got 10 minutes. Do we, uh, or 15 minutes? 10. We've got 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I understand. We, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we haven't been keeping time well. Please. And uh, the way uh, probably we would uh, want to proceed is that you can identify yourself, restrict yourself to questions, please. And uh, maybe we'll take two, three questions and then uh, try and get an answer. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Shakil Ahmed from UNDP. Uh, my question goes to uh, Dr. Tahir. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation on the, uh, uh, your study on the earthquake. My question is that you mentioned that consumption assets level have, uh, in fact, you know, that has a positive impact uh, because of the ad and other uh, interventions. Uh, how would that compare with the, with the level in the controlled villages or, you know, in the villages which were away from the uh, fault line? Uh, and uh, and I'm asking this because just to know is that uh, whether the inequality uh, between you know the villages which where you conducted the survey and those which were away from the fault lines is that increasing or decreasing at least you know on this particular aspect. And secondly, uh, it's kind of a clarification is that when you said that you know you uh, selected villages which were away from the fault line, how far away those villages were? And now and now I'm asking this question because. You know, in Pakistan, we already have inequalities. Uh, if you see the uh, inequalities in terms of education outcomes, in terms of food security, some of the districts are uh, performing better, other districts are not. So I'm saying that there were already kind of a baseline in inequality, and one should be kind of looking at is that inequality increasing or not. Uh, but if you are kind of, you know, just comparing the cross-section data, and you are saying that, you know, the enrollment or other kind of, you know, outcomes or kind of, you know, they're, they're differing, perhaps, you know, they were already there. Thank you. Uh. How did you get data? It's not working. Nine year old. So how do you get data from minor children? Did you consult their parents or did you directly get data from the minor child? What was, the, what was the procedure for data collection, actually? Thank you. Okay, I think we've got the question. Is there... Uh, on the other part, the farthest village uh, roughly is about uh, 65 to 70 kilometers uh, from the fault line. So roughly the distribution is that the median village is about 25 to 30 kilometers, right? There's 126 villages. So roughly that's the area uh, in, in all four. The four districts were Muzaffarabad, Bagh, Aptabad and Mansera, the four hardest hit districts. And it was a random sample of villages from the 1998 census list. Um, consumption, all the, the tables that I showed were uh, relative to the distance to the fault line. So uh, what, what I'm showing is, is not that, that consumption in these uh, villages, it, it did go up, but what I'm saying is that the consumption increases in the villages that are further away from the fault line are really not very different from consumption increases in the villages that were away from the fault line. The differences are not significant. The only difference is in, in physical infrastructure, construction of the house. That actually is better closer to the fault line now. This is a cross-section. So our counterfactual is that in the absence of the earthquake, the villages closer to the fault line would have been would have looked like villages away from the fault line. That was the whole point of going through this identification exercise. Uh, village level inequality, uh, we did do some measures, right? Because we are doing, uh, we have a, a census also, so we could construct some inequality measures 
we did do inequality measures, not in this paper, but we did uh, kind of heterogeneity of various sorts. Um, inequality wasn't very high from what I recall uh, in terms of both uh, uh, control of villages away and treatment. Um, one interesting thing, very interesting, I can tell you that in Azad Kashmir, land inequality is very low compared to, let's say, rest of Pakistan and Punjab. Land holdings are very small. So all of this earthquake area, roughly in the baseline, is pretty egalitarian generally. But we didn't look at inequality changes over time. Um, OK. Thank you. Can we have? Yeah. Very quick, uh, two small questions. Uh, um, I'm Arvind Virmani. Uh, uh, Professor Andravi, you know, there's a little puzzle there uh, because, as you said, current affects weight, cumulative affects height, and so it's a little puzzling how quickly the effect of an earthquake has come. You know, it's like you were saying within four years, you affect height. It's a slight puzzle. Uh, you may want to think about that. Uh, second question, you know, because it would take longer, right? If your consumption is the same, if it was lower for a while, or if sanitation, as we've just said, was poorer for a long time, you'd get a cumulative effect. Anyway, uh, the second uh, question to uh, Jeff, uh, you know, uh, in my both my uh, interstate study and the cross-country study, female education actually turns out to be uh, quite significant in addition uh, to the issue you have sanitation. You know, I also find sanitation is important. Uh, but uh, it's really got to do with information and knowledge. What, what is your uh, view on that? I did see, yes, please. I just wanted to ask a couple of quick questions with regards to the, the earthquake study and the sanitation study. I was wondering if there were um, any effects that could be observed between uh, boys and girls or uh, along the birth order dimension. Because there was some work, I don't remember who it was by, but on India about the role of birth order um, in terms of explaining the difference between uh, India and the sub-Saharan African countries as uh, regards to the height uh, of, of the children. That birth order was, uh, was very important. Um, so I just wanted to know if there was any, uh, any results on that. And then and, um, with regard to the earthquake, if there was some, um, if there's medical research regarding what, what is the, um, the, the mechanism through which these, uh, the shocks like the earthquake are having such a huge negative impact on children, young children, especially unborn children. Thank you. Yes, please. I have a quick observation. Um, uh, I didn't get a chance to uh, to listen to all the presentations, but uh, since it's, it's it's about the uh, the malnutrition and and the quality of the social service delivery affecting uh, the health of 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 the people in the region uh, in this uh, South Asia, Pakistan, and India. I was wondering that uh, since this started happening for the past 20, 25 years or so. So how this gonna impact the gen, uh, uh, genes of it? So, so the uh, the fittest to survive, and we've seen that in the African countries over the period of time that that now the uh, the kids are coming up with with the, with the, with the genes which has that defect in it. So, in in the South Asia, do we still have time to work on that, or or it has started impacting on the genes of? Uh, of uh, those uh, areas which are badly hit over the past 20, 25 years. Thank you. Okay, because we are running really, really short of time. Maybe I can give this, uh, you know, the minute that we have to the to the two speakers to respond. Dr. Hammer, would you? Are you able to hear me there? Yeah, no, so I lost. I lost the video feed, but I just come uh, in at the end to make quick comments. Uh, um, uh, Zafarula mentioned uh, a, a bunch of them, or uh, alluded to some. Electricity might uh, be as as important as, as other things. Female education is extremely important. It's never not been shown. 
It's never not been shown to be important for children's health and education, uh, health and, uh, and nutritional status, infrastructure of all kinds, roads to get people to doctors instead of making doctors go in the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, but also roads can get children, girls to school and... Okay, M malnutrition, uh, well actually malnutrition is measured by uh, height for age is very tightly related to general health anyway because it's, refle uh, it's, it's reflected in, in, in uh, long-term nutritional status including all of the times the kids get ill. Um, but uh, female education is always, always important. Um, uh, uh, Teresa, the, the birth order study also another thing that uh, is very important. Uh, Diane Coffey is, is, has been uh, 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 doing a lot of work on that and it is true that the children of wives of younger sons seem to be dis uh, systematically um, uh, shorter than, than, than other children in the, in the household. There are lots of determinants of, uh, of, of nutrition. I really just wanted to focus on this one for this presentation. But they all re look at infrastructure, education, stru uh, family structure, uh, and other kinds of things, and some other things that uh, governments can intervene in. Not a lot of evidence on medical care. Dr. Indrabi? So, listen, we don't have time. I, I'll just quickly say a, a larger point which is happening in, in, in studies from around the world, which is that we are seeing very long-term persistence of very short-term effects. I think that's the general theme coming from a lot of this research. So you can have shocks that happen for short periods of time, but they can be intense, but they have very persistent effects, right? So people are now doing studies of these kids going into labor markets, outcomes, their own further kids. I don't know if it's going from genes or whatever, but they have persistent effects. Like David Figlio is doing at low birth weight in, within twins and then tracking them for about 12, 15 years, you see their effects coming in college, you see their effects coming much later in life. So there's a longer term effect going on, uh, which is going on. In the earthquake, we don't know all the different things that are affected. It affects a lot of different things. So in that sense, these results are reduced form. I don't know whether it was coming from malnutrition as such, right? So many things are affected. So one has to be careful in terms of saying exact channel identification. Dr. Murli Dharan, can we have your views also? Would you like to say something? Yeah, no, I lost the bits of feed about three minutes ago, so I can't see anybody, but hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, so uh, it's almost like I have to say something for being awake at, at 11 o'clock in my office over here. <laughs> but uh, again, apologies for not being there in person and hi to all the people I know there. Um, Tahir, Ad Adnan, Arvind, Jeff, uh, uh, um, Su Sujit and others. So I just want to make two comments. I think this is something Jeff probably mentioned anyway, but I just want to reiterate this again and again, is uh, the cycle The cycle paper provides a nice chance to go back to some of the principles of public finance because from an economist's perspective, it's actually a puzzle that the cycle program worked better um, than how um, cash programs might have worked. So and I'm sure Jeff mentioned this, even though I didn't hear the talk, is that the first principles of public economics is that you focus on things that have externality first before you do publicly provide private goods and so I think the cycle project is an interesting example of in fact the exception rather than the norm of where in-kind provision can do better and I think Sujit alluded to some of the reasons here which is part of what you're doing is the coordinated provision is changing social norms and changing peer pressure and changing the expectations with regard to um, with regard to what is considered normal about these girls going to school uh, the second comment I wanted to make again had to do with I mean um, something Sujit mentioned about cash transfers and people uh, and being worried about alcohol. In fact, the most recent studies on uh, unconditional cash transfers um, done by Give Directly in Kenya, in fact, find that when you do unconditional cash transfers, you're even getting a slight reduction in alcohol consumption, and that is explained by the fact that the poor the poor people are not drinking because they are irresponsible, but a lot of people are often drinking as antidepressants and so if the cash transfers actually gives you a hope of a better future they seem to find like I mean that the drinking is actually going down so I think you know the, I, I don't want to make broader sweeping statements but rather the point is just highlighting the importance of evidence on any of these issues um, relative to kind of armchair theorizing about why the poor do what they do thank you 
so I should stop there. Uh, and of course, I guess, I mean, uh, I, I hope the video presentation was so clear that there were no questions for the cycle paper. But sorry again for not being there. And, and, and thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Murli Dharan. That was, uh, now let me very quickly take a minute and conclude. We've had an interesting morning. We've had three very uh, interesting and diversified papers. Dr. Hammer's paper, of course, points out to the fact that, um, you know, preventive health ha associates with it externalities. And we as a policy maker sometimes tend to, uh, you know, concentrate more on the curative rather on the preventive side, which actually is a policy that we in the South Asian region reach, ne really need to look into. Uh, the Dr. Indrabi's paper again made some very important conclusions. We've all gone through it. But the fact is that these natural calamities affect the poor more. And then we need to just keep that in, you know, in, our, in the perspective also. He also highlights the role of maternal education in all of this. Not, you know, the much that you, we say about it, it's not enough. The, uh, the Dr. Murli Dharan's paper, of course, uh, the, uh, the impact of cycling on uh, education, uh, again, very important study coming up with very interesting conclusions. But ladies and gentlemen, we in South Asia is a region where 44% of the world poor reside. We need to keep that in perspective. And we need to ensure that we need to know that social sectors is the sustainable way of improving and getting our people out of poverty. Our emphasis on education, be it preventive, be it curative, our emphasis on education to promote it, our emphasis, however it may be, and of course on natural uh, disasters. This should be the area of priority for us as policy makers. We need to come up with the right kind of policies and as politicians, as a member of the political, uh, you know, the, the, the assembly here, there needs to be policy focus and there needs to be priority to these sectors. We need to learn from each other's experiences. And I think I thank the organizers for getting us all together, because this uh, and occasions like this are the ones which, through which we can learn from each other's experiences. And let me not hold on uh, now to this mic. Let's have a nice cup of tea now. We've had a very interesting morning. Thank you so much to the panelists, to the speakers, and to the audience. Wonderful. <laughs>